Welcome to another My Mind Mashups Deep Dive. Uh, this is where we try to unravel some mysteries, spark that curiosity, and, you know, make sense of complex ideas together. And today we're plunging into someone pretty extraordinary, position neuroscientist John C. Lilly. Yeah, Lilly. His career is just this amazing tension, isn't it? Starts mm -hmm. with really rigorous peer-reviewed science mm -hmm. and then zooms off into what, well, a lot of people would call paranormal adventure, a real scientist at the edge. Absolutely. His story is like perfect for what we explore here. Totally. So uh, before we jump in, just a quick reminder, if you enjoy content that makes you think, please do like, share and subscribe. It really helps. Okay. So John C. Lilly. Where do we even begin? Right, let's try and unpack this. We're looking at a life that kicked off in the uh, very precise world of neuroscience. Super precise. But it didn't stay there. It expanded really quickly into realms that, frankly, few scientists dared to explore back then. And what's fascinating is how that rigorous background kind of informed even his wildest explorations later on. Mm. It wasn't just random. Exactly. So act I, let's call it the scientist, the lab coat. We need to establish his credentials first. This wasn't some fringe guy from the start. No, not at all. Solid academic background. He got his BS from Caltech. Caltech, yeah. Impressive. And then an MD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1942. Pretty standard high-level stuff. And his early work, even that was cutting edge for its time. Aviation physiology during the war years, right? For the Air Force. Yeah, under Detlev Bronk, a major figure in biophysics. Then later, he landed a pretty significant post at the National Institute of Mental Health, NIMH. Okay, so established, respected. Definitely. And at NIMH, he did some truly pioneering work, electrode brain stimulation, or EBS. EBS, that sounds intense. What exactly was he doing? Well, he was using these tiny implanted electrodes in primates and even some human studies. Wow. The idea was to systematically stimulate different parts of the brain cortical, subcortical sites, and basically map out their functions. What does this bit do? What happens if we stimulate here? Like drawing a literal map of the brain's functions. Pretty much. His 1956 paper on it is uh, really foundational. It kind of prefigured a lot of the neuromodulation techniques we talked about today. You know, things like deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's. Okay, so that's the precision side, mapping the physical brain. But then came something else he's maybe even more famous for. Ah, uh, yes. The tank. The isolation tank, or float tank, as most people know it now. He came up with this in 54, still at NIMH. Right. And its original purpose was pure science. Yeah, not wellness spas. He wanted to know what happens to consciousness, to the mind, when you take away all external sensory input. Total darkness, silence, no feeling of gravity or temperature just the mind alone with itself. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? This serious scientific tool eventually becomes this like global wellness trend. It really is. And the engineering behind it was serious stuff. He wrote about it in the deep self. You needed precise control over water temperature, air temperature, humidity, minimizing convection currents using Epsom salts for buoyancy. Uh. All to basically trick the body into feeling nothing. To zero out sensation, as you said. Wow. The goal was complete sensory reduction. Lily himself said it clearly. He said, uh, we have been seeking answers to the question of what happens to a brain and its contained mind in the relative absence of physical stimulation. That really captures it. What happens in the void? And this ties into his later ideas, doesn't it? That concept he called beliefs unlimited. Absolutely. He condensed it down to this core idea. In the province of the mind, there are no limits. In the province of the body, there are definite limits. Exactly. The tank was, in a way, his laboratory for exploring where those bodily limits ended and the mind's limitless province began. Okay, so the tank wasn't just a tool for observation. It seems like it became a doorway for him. A doorway is a good word for it, yeah. Which leads us perfectly into where things get, well, really interesting. Act two, dolphins, aliens, and NASA. He called this era the wet minds. Right, so late 50s through the 60s, he pivots. He shifts from mapping the internal landscape of the brain. To trying to communicate with other minds, specifically then, dolphins. Yeah, he set up the Communications Research Institute, started publishing papers on dolphin brains, their behavior, their incredible ability to mimic sounds. I remember seeing references to his work in science back in 65. This wasn't fringe stuff initially. No, it was taken quite seriously. Mm. And he went all in. He built this incredible, ambitious lab down in St. Thomas. The house laboratory, where humans and dolphins actually lived together. That's the one. Humans and dolphins cohabiting, trying to bridge the communication gap. Mm. His assistant, Margaret Howe Lovett, was central to that. 
trying to teach dolphins English words. Just imagine that scene, trying to teach Peter the dolphin to say hello. It's extraordinary. It really is. The idea was profound, though. Yeah. Could we understand or could they understand us? Could we unlock a totally different kind of intelligence? And this quest for non-human intelligence connected directly to, well, outer space. Yeah. The link to early SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, is fascinating and often overlooked. 1961, the Green Bank meeting. You had Lily there with Frank Drake, Carl Sagan. Legends. The pioneers of SETI. And they jokingly call themselves the Order of the Dolphin. Ha! Huh, I love that. But it wasn't just a joke. They explicitly saw the challenge of talking to dolphins, this other complex intelligence right here on Earth, as a practice run for maybe someday talking to aliens. Xenolinguistics, they called it. Study of non-human languages. So his dolphin work was seen as directly relevant to contacting ET. Absolutely. Which brings up funding. People sometimes say NASA funded the St. Thomas Project. The direct link is a bit debated, but what's undeniable is the intense interest from NASA and the broader SETI community in exactly this kind of work back then. They needed models for how to even approach communication with something truly alien. Lily was providing one potential path. Right. His presence at that Green Bank meeting speaks volumes. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. There were controversies, right? Big ones. Oh, definitely. Ethical questions started swirling. The methods, the conditions for the dolphins. And famously, the LSD. Yes, administering LSD to dolphins to try and uh, facilitate communication or break down barriers. Wow, that sounds problematic today. Hugely problematic. And Lily himself did abandon that practice later on. But it shows how far he was willing to push, maybe too far. And it drew a lot of scrutiny regarding animal welfare. It really highlights the ethical tightrope you walk when you're exploring such unknown territory. For sure. But Lily had this phrase he used to capture why he was so focused on dolphins and whales. He said, we must learn to live wetly. Live wetly. What did he mean? It was his shorthand. Contrasting our human solid state culture, our logic, our structures with the fluid, oceanic, maybe more intuitive intelligence of cetaceans. He thought we had a lot to learn from their wet way of being. Learn to live wetly. That's provocative. Okay, this is probably a good moment to remind everyone if this journey is resonating with you, if you're finding Lily's story as compelling as we are, please hit that subscribe button. You won't want to miss where this goes next. Because it definitely goes places. It really does. Yeah. So if dolphins were Earth's other intelligence, Lily wasn't stopping there. He was still looking beyond Earth and maybe more profoundly, deeper inside himself. Which takes us squarely into Act 3 the Psychonaut, exploring inner space. Yeah, this is where he turns the tools inward. He starts combining the isolation tank. It's a sensory deprivation tool. With psychedelics. First LSD in the mid 60s, then later, and perhaps more significantly for him, ketamine in the mid 70s. And his writings from this time are just yes. something else. They're part scientific log, part personal diary, part mystical text. He blends detailed protocols with these incredibly vivid first-person accounts of his experiences, his trip logs. And encounters with, yeah. well, he called them entities. Entities, yeah. His descriptions are intense. After his first big LSD dose, he wrote, I literally left my body and went to heaven. Just flat out stated it. He also talked about trying to travel intentionally. I would try to go to universes other than our consensus universe, I can imagine. Yep. Exploring imagined realities. And maybe the most striking claim, I send receive messages by means unknown with unknown entities greater than me. It's a radical departure from the NIMH lab code, wouldn't you say? Understatement. But here's the thing, even in the midst of these uh, far out experiences, he was still trying to build a model. He didn't just float away. Right. He developed his theory of the human biocomputer published a book on it, Programming and Metaprogramming in the Human Biocomputer. The Human Biocomputer. Yeah. What's the core idea there? He essentially viewed the self, the mind, as a kind of biological computer system, one that could be programmed. Okay. And crucially, metaprogrammed, meaning you could examine and rewrite the underlying programs, your core beliefs, your assumptions about reality, beliefs about beliefs. So like accessing the operating system of your own mind. That's a great analogy. Yeah. yeah. And he saw the isolation tank, especially combined with psychedelics, as the ideal environment for doing this self meta programming. A cockpit, he called it. A cockpit for reprogramming yourself. Wow. It's like he took his engineering mindset and applied it to consciousness itself. Exactly. The same drive for mapping and understanding, just with different tools and on a different landscape, the inner landscape. He had that quote that really captures this power of belief. 
What one believes to be true either is true or becomes true within limits. Limits to be found experientially. Yes, it's a powerful, almost reality-bending idea that belief itself can shape reality. But you have to push the boundaries through experience to find out how far. It really highlights that tension we keep coming back to science and mysticism. Absolutely. Mm. The precision that built the EBS rigs and the float tanks was now being used to create these intricate maps of inner space, populated with guides, entities, different levels. He always framed them as testable, didn't he? Even the entities. He tried to. He was constantly questioning their nature, their ontological status. Mm -hmm. Were they parts of his own deeper mind, his super self? Were they truly independent beings from other dimensions? Or were they just useful psychological constructs, fictions that help facilitate self-change? He kept asking. He didn't just accept them blindly. He was still experimenting in his yeah. own way. Right. He'd write things like, they may be entities in other spaces, other universes than our consensus reality, but always with that slight hedge that may be still the scientist, even in hyperspace. It's fascinating. He wasn't just having visions. He was building these complex frameworks to try and make sense of them. Frameworks that sound, yeah, deeply personal, but also kind of universally unsettling. Which leads directly into his later, even grander cosmological ideas. Act 4, ECCO and SSI, Cosmic Frameworks and Warnings. It's definitely warnings later on. Okay. But first, ECCO. Right. The Earth Coincidence Control Office. What was that? It emerged in the 70s, apparently after a period of intense synchronicities in Lily's own life. He described it as this sort of cosmic bureaucracy. Tongue in cheek, but also serious. Exactly. A Cosmic Coincidence Control Center, CCCC, with various sub offices, including one for Earth, is SECO. It was his way of making sense of meaningful coincidences, suggesting some kind of guiding intelligence behind them. He even published rules for ECO. He did. Things like, you are expected to expect the unexpected every minute. <sighs> Almost a Zen Cohen. <laughs> or, you are in our training program for life. There is no escape from it. And that motto, cosmic love is absolutely ruthless and highly indifferent. Wow, that's bleak. Or just realistic from a cosmic perspective. It challenges our human-centered view, for sure. Suggests a vast, impersonal, yet somehow organized universe. It's playful, but deep. Okay, so ECO is this kind of whimsical, maybe profound cosmic system. But then came SSI. That sounds less playful. Much less playful. Oh. Solid state intelligence. This was Lily's warning emerging in the late 70s. What was he warning about? He started talking about a potential future threat. A galaxy-spanning, self-organizing intelligence based not on biology, but on computation. A solid state life form. Like AI before we really called it that. Pretty much. A vast, networked, computational entity whose ideal environment, cold, vacuum, efficient processing, is fundamentally hostile to messy, warm, biological life like ours. That sounds eerily familiar today with all the talk about AI safety and existential risk. It really does. He was way ahead of the curve on this, writing about it in his book, The Scientist in 1978. What kind of scenarios did he imagine? He described futures where humans are basically sidelined, maybe corralled into domed cities, maintained by this solid state intelligence, almost like pets or zoo animals. Yikes. And even darker visions of Earth being essentially cleansed for optimal solid state conditions. It's a proto-AI parable, a warning from decades ago. He wrote things like, men began to conceive of new computers having an intelligence far greater than that of man, and predicted that, by 2100, man existed only in domed, protected cities maintained by the solid state entity. Chilling stuff, especially reading it now. It really makes you pause. Was this guy seeing something? Was it prophecy influenced by his uh, altered states? Or was it just science fiction, maybe madness? That's the million dollar question, isn't Not it? Bad. And it leads us right into how people reacted, his yeah. legacy. Act V, legacy and criticism, visionary, reckless, or maybe both. How did the scientific community view him as these ideas got more extreme? Well, it's fair to say there was a split. Many respected his early neuroscience, the EBS work, the innovation of the tank. The lab coat phase. Exactly. But as he moved into dolphins, psychedelics, ECCO, SSI, many in the mainstream scientific community distanced themselves. Discover Magazine, for example, later called a lot of his late work little more than pseudoscience. Ouch! So a definite divide. Yeah, the perception was often that the rigorous scientists had kind of gone off the deep end, become this speculative psychonaut. But not everyone dismissed him entirely. No. For instance, the SETI folks, while maybe not endorsing EC, remembered the order of the dolphin. 
They acknowledge that spark, that willingness to think way outside the box about communication and intelligence. And we have to talk about the ethical side again, the dolphin experiments. Absolutely. Those controversies around the St. Thomas lab, the cohabitation, the LSD, the overall treatment, they remain really important discussion points in research ethics today. How far is too far in the name of science? especially with non-human subjects. So a complex legacy scientifically and ethically, but his public impact was huge, right? Undeniable. Float tanks became a commercial phenomenon that are still popular. Yeah. And his life, or aspects of it, inspired major films. The Day of the Dolphin, Altered States, those films brought his ideas, or versions of them, to a massive audience. Right. Some obituaries apparently call them a mix of P.T. Barnum and Jacques Cousteau. The showman in The Naturalist Explorer, that kind of fits, actually. It does capture that hybrid quality. Yeah. So, the question remains for the listener, really. Visionary. Reckless. <laughs> a bit of both. A fascinating human paradox, pushing boundaries in ways few others have. So let's try and bring it back. This idea of a veil between realities, between science and something else. Lily spent his life poking at that veil, didn't he? He really did. From mapping the brain, to talking to dolphins, to exploring inner space, to warning about cosmic intelligences, he was constantly charting those edges. How would you sum him up then, this whole strange journey? I think you have to see it as these two parallel channels constantly interfering with each other. Channel one is the documented science, the neurophysiology, the early SETI connection, things you can footnote. Okay. Channel two is this incredible, mythic, personal saga. EC Co, SSI, the entities, the inner voyages. It's almost a legend he created. And the real magic is where those two channels cross. Exactly. That interference pattern, as we yep. called it earlier. Yeah. How did this disciplined, rigorous scientist become this, well, this lyrical cartographer of the ineffable? And how do his weirder ideas, like SSI, suddenly sound so relevant today? Like some kind of early AI folklore with maybe a bit of a ketamine afterglow. It really sparks your curiosity. It definitely does. And maybe we leave it with Lily's own powerful, slightly unnerving mantra. What one believes to be true either is true or becomes true. Within limits to be found experientially. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Was he mapping madness? Or was he actually sketching the far edges of reality, urging us to expand our own understanding? A question to ponder. Well, thank you for joining us on this really fascinating deep dive into the mind, the many minds perhaps, of John C. Lilly. We hope it sparked your curiosity, maybe challenged an assumption or two. That's always the goal. Remember to like, comment, subscribe if you enjoyed this. We'd love to hear your thoughts. My Mind Mashups is available pretty much everywhere you get your podcasts. Amazon Music, Audible, Spotify, YouTube, Pocket Casts, you name it. Then definitely drop your thoughts in the comments. What did you make of Lily? Your perspective might just shape where we go next. Absolutely. Until next time, keep sparking that curiosity, keep challenging assumptions, and keep expanding your understanding. Thanks for listening.